welcome everyone. I'm loving the backgrounds. Vicki is uh, in her autumnal vibe over there. You bet, today's the first day. <laughs> yes, the first day of fall. What a great Founders Day to have. Indeed. Just give everyone another few seconds to log in and join us today. We had 175 alumni register for this event. So take a second and introduce yourself in the chat. Say where you're from, when you attended Florida Tech, your favorite color, whatever you want to do. <laughs> I see lots of alumni who've joined us in the past. I see uh, some alumni who are already also Florida Tech staff, Stephanie Herndon, you know, Campanini just ran, but he's here. Wilbur, class of 99, Michael from Stewart. Lisa says, hi, Dr. Patterson. So excited to hear you talk today. Yes, we're all excited. Well, thank you all. Thank you all for joining us. One uh, favor that I'm gonna ask before we kick off is to everyone, please uh, keep your microphones on mute throughout the duration of the event so that we can hear Dr. Patterson's lovely voice loud and clear. All right, I'm gonna get started uh, with the introduction. So happy Founders Day to everyone. Um, so pleased to have Dr. Patterson with us today to celebrate this 63rd birthday of our wonderful university, Florida Institute of Technology. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jillian LeClaire and I work in the Office of Alumni Affairs here in Melbourne, Florida on our main campus from a beautiful new alumni center. So if you are ever visiting Melbourne, please come see us. Um, so I also wanted to see if, if um, any of the folks joining us today have had Dr. Patterson as a professor when they were at Florida Tech. So if you also wanna go to the chat, right, if you had him for what class, any memories that you had, he has been uh, teaching at Florida Tech for 40 years. So there's a reason why he's leading us on this journey today. He's been around a long time and knows a lot of things about campus, a lot of secret histories and stories. So I'm excited to hear a lot of his insights. So we're gonna have uh, about a half hour, 40 minute talk um, for Dr. Patterson or however long he wants to go. After that, we'll open it up for a Q&A session if there's anything that you're particularly curious about. And then to wrap things up, I'm going to ask you some trivia questions and the winners will receive some very nice Florida Tech gear. So uh, pay special attention to Professor Patterson's talk, hint, hint. Now to tell you a little bit about Dr. Gordon Patterson. He is of course a professor at Florida Tech School of Arts and Communication. And like I said, I sat at the university for 40 years. He currently teaches courses in environmental history, history of science, ancient and medieval, history and culture of China, history and culture of Japan, United States history from reconstruction to the present and ancient civilization and modern civilization. He is widely regarded as Florida Tech's resident historian and uh, published his book, Florida Institute of Technology in 2000, which showcases the school's extraordinary history. A beloved professor on campus, Dr. Patterson has won numerous faculty awards, including faculty service awards, a faculty teaching award, and the Florida Tech Alumni Association Outstanding Faculty Award, award among others. He also serves on the planning committee for the annual Martin Luther King Jr. commemoration event held each January on campus. In April 2019, the Botanical Gardens on the Florida Tech main campus were officially named the Joy and Gordon Patterson Botanical Gardens, honoring the couple's commitment to the health and legacy of the gardens. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce the wonderful, the inspiring, the poetic Dr. Gordon Patterson. Jillian, I. I, I wish my mother were here to hear the nice things that you said about me. And it's such a pleasure to see so many of you. I see 
a couple of people who started out in classes with me and dropped out multiple times, Al Hagopian, uh, frightened by uh, the midterms or whatever. I also see one of my recent students, Jordan Chandler, who graduated just a couple of years ago and is already actively engaged in Neighborhood Up as a board member, which is one of the marvelous outreaches of our community. So it is a delight, an honor and a pleasure to be here. And when Jillian was describing and asking about if anybody ever had a class with me, my apologies and injuries that I did, I will do my best to address. I will sneak or hack into the registrar and see if we can't fix any error that I made on my part. I sent an email out to the faculty this morning about 7.30, I was riding my bicycle uh, to campus. I've ridden a bicycle to campus for nearly 40 years. And as I was crossing by the Shepherd Building, I saw uh, a man walking in front of me. And I have a little horn. I used to have a Fisher-Price bell, but it broke down. They just don't make children's toys like they used to. And I honked my horn. And the fellow with the backpack turned around. And it was uh, President Dwayne McKay. Uh, who uh, was on his way to another day leading our university. And I looked at him and I said, happy birthday. Today is the 63rd anniversary of our university's first classes at 7 p.m. on September 22nd, 1958. About 144 missile men, and that was both men and women, as some of you know, who worked at the then called Missile Test Project, um, had arrived at what was then O'Galley Junior High School for the commencement of classes. And so um, President uh, uh, McKay asked me how things were going. And I told him, I've got terrific students. And I do. It's so good to be back in the classroom. And so good to see those young people. It's so good to see them throwing Frisbees across Crawford Green. And he looked at me and he said exactly what Jerry Cooper would have said don't mess them up. And I thought about that. And I told that to my three classes that I taught today. And then I thought about John Lewis. And John Lewis said there's, you know, there, 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 there's good trouble. And I think we at Florida Tech have been messing things up in a good way for 60, 63 years. And next year, we're going to turn 64. And I hope that we can get a chorus together singing that second song from Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band and demonstrate you sure can love someone when they're 64. So what I'd like to do is take a few minutes and just kind of walk through some images that I think some of you'll recognize and some of you will say, my heavens, did they have toothbrushes back in that ancient time of American history? Well, we did. This picture is from a January day, the 31st of January in 1958, the man right there in the center with his arms crossed would later rise to the position of being a Florida Tech faculty member. At the time, he was just a general, but he was in charge, General John Medeiros, of the Missile Test Project. It's a little before or just about 7 o'clock on that night, and about four hours later, America would launch its first satellite. Explore one in orbit. To General Medeiros's uh, right on the screen is, of course, Kurt Dubis, who would become the head of NASA, which later in 1958 would come into being when Dwight Eisenhower signed in July the law uh, uh, into practice that created NASA. That picture is a signal for what would become the transformation of this little sleepy fishing town. You're looking at a picture of downtown Melbourne. Those of you familiar with that, right there where my arrow is pointing is the 1900 building. Uh, this is US 1. They can't make roads straight in Florida. For some reason, they turn and they meander. So we have US 1. And over here will lead to what was at that time a drawbridge uh, crossing over to the barrier islands. Um, and in the Atlantic. This town in 1950 had a population of about 4,000 people. But what began in 1948, when the missile pro test project was announced that it was going to find a home 
on that little bit of land uh, sticking out into the Atlantic called Cape Canaveral was an arrival of what would prove to be 75,000, 75,000 in the next decade, scientists, engineers, technicians, which would make it their business to create the American space program. And one of the challenges was that there was a problem. There is, in those who study science and technology, an appetite always to study more. But there was no educational institutions. And this cartoon about the idea of forming a space university was one which I think caught the imagination of a number of people and led to an evening at the trade winds and some of you had dorm rooms uh, in the trade winds hotel that's in india atlantic it was famous for being a little bit of walkie key in florida uh, it was run by a guy named tom doherty and on the 6th of june in 1958 jerry cooper and harold dibble and a couple of other people, Donya Nixon and George uh, uh, Stevens, organized an engineer's cotillion. And the reason they did that was they were trying to raise the money to run an ad in the newspaper. Um, and the evening uh, began with this august group of people. Right there in the center is uh, Harold Dibble. Uh, over on the left side, second from the left, is uh, Jerry Cooper. Uh, they wanted to raise money. Uh, Natalie Cooper, she told me about it. she she was uh, persuaded to sing a song, uh, and then uh, Lila Williamson, who'd been to Hawaii, did an Hawaiian dance. Uh, Tom Doherty, who had run the hotel, uh, was responsible for writing the hors d'oeuvres. And in the story that Jerry Cooper told me about that night, Jerry Cooper, who was a person who liked to sample uh, treats took a bite of one of the hors d'oeuvres and said, these are taste lousy, and went to Doherty and said, you got to do better than this. And Doherty took uh, that as an insult. And Cooper said, well, let's just step outside and resolve this matter. And someone whispered in Jerry Cooper's ear, the man was a professional fighter. Uh, Jerry Cooper said, I think these hors d'oeuvres will uh, serve well. The Fort Worth, Worth Star Telegram took that picture of one of our, you know, you know, burgeoning computers, there you see Harold Dibble on the left and Jerry Cooper, uh, working at the RCA Systems Analysis Division. I, they, they began meeting, and many of you know this story, at the Pelican Bar that's at the end of O'Galley Boulevard and A1A. And they would meet and the legendary 37 cents was laid down to go start your university with it. But I tell you, more important than 37 cents was that man in the center of Harold Dribble and Jerry Cooper, uh, uh, that's Homer Denius. And Homer Denius and George Shaw had taken a little company they'd started up in Washington, D.C. called Radiation, and they'd moved to Melbourne. Homer Denius and George Shaw became two of the earliest advocates in the university. And Denius promised Cooper and if you can find a place to build a campus someday in Melbourne, I'll give you some money to start building that campus and making it a place where men and women can go to school. So the engineer's cotillion took place. Uh, this was the creation of Brevard Engineering College. George Cibola, and some of you may uh, have known George. He was uh, early on a student, 1958. He drew up our first coat of arms, and I think in my history of science class, I should probably put that there because the majority of my students would not know what that thing is hanging below the satellite. They'd look at that and say, is that some kind of pool cue or some odd thing? And they would be astounded at how good calculations you can make uh, with uh, slide rule. Ed Collagen's got a marvelous collection of slide rules that uh, Ed is thinking about making an exhibit for the library out of. And one of the slide rules is from uh, Fred Bologna, who just passed away this summer, a nuclear engineer. And it's a much bigger slide rule because in nuclear engineering, the calculations need to be pretty much spot on. 
and it is a remarkable tool. Brevard Engineering College was an idea that grew out of Clipper's experiences living in Bridgeport, Connecticut, where he had uh, worked for the Remington uh, DuPont Arms uh, Company uh, and had taught in the Bridgeport Engineering Institute. And he came down to Florida in 1957 to see his old childhood friend, Jim Stoms, who had gone to work in the missile test project and had risen to be launch director all the way through Gemini. Uh, and Stom said, there's something exciting happened down here. Come on down. And Cooper took an interview and decided not to take the job. And then one January day in 1958, driving with Natalie Cooper, he turned his MG over in a snowbank and said, Natalie, we're going to Florida. And they arrived here. And in February and March, Cooper began spreading the seeds to the idea of forming the university that would lead to the engineer's cotillion in June. The advertisement, this is it. This is what a hundred bucks and a smile and a wink will get you. This is the advertisement that they brought out. Final registration for the fall term. Graduate courses were offered in electrical engineering and applied mathematics and associate degree in business administration, electrical engineering and mechanical engineering. The registration would take place in the one building of what had been formed in 1956 called the University of Melbourne, which was an offshoot of an idea of a group of progressive women. And in the story of our university, women take a leadership position early on. And that's a central fact in our histories, our university's history. The registration also was held at Ogalley Junior High School. 144 people signed up uh, for that. And there is an aerial view that Sterling uh, photo let me get when I uh, went through their archives of what the school looked like in the autumn of 1958. It's now a, a West Shore Junior Senior High School. We rented three classrooms, three evenings a week, seven o'clock to 10 o'clock at night. And on Monday, the 22nd of September in 1958, in the midst of a crisis over the Taiwan Straits and a couple of islands, Kimoy and Matsu, some of you may remember that we uh, had a crisis back in the 1950s with China. We would never have a crisis with China in the 21st century. And so that night they met in the first class. They had a student meeting and um, Jim Irvin, who passed away a few years ago, was uh, a, an attendee, I think, at that meeting. And it was reported to me that the way in which they did it in the student meeting, uh, they were selling the books uh, and selling pencils. Uh, and I believe it was Dribble who got up and spoke. And then Cooper was introduced as the president of Brevard Engineering College. And someone yelled out, hell, that's the guy that sold me the books and the pencils. Uh, from the very beginning of our university, we've been a can-do place. Uh, if you can't do it, then probably you're not in the right place. You make ends meet at Florida Tech. So the university launches itself on the 22nd. That's our first board of trustees. Closest to you on the right is George Shaw, who uh, passed away just a few years ago and was a great friend of the university's. One of the founders of radiation was Homer Denius, later, of course, to become L3 Harris. To his right is uh, Norman Lund, who had come to Florida in 1923 as an engineer to lay out what would become US-1 and liked Melbourne and stayed here and became a leader in the community. Over to the uh, left of Jerry Cooper is Cliff Maddox, who was active in the missile test project. The attorney Garrett is there, and Harold Dribble is at the end. Uh, they met in a small building that was the uh, library, the first library of Florida Institute of Technology. Three years later, in January 1961, uh, this group met. Of course, you recognize Dribble and Cooper, but on the right is Elizabeth Wood, the founder of Melbourne Village, a quite remarkable progressive woman who believed that change came by education of both men and women, and Norman, uh, uh, Hubert Normile, 
And what's being handed to Cooper is a document that says for $1 a year that this enterprise called Brevard Engineering College will have the full rights to the use of the 35 acres that are now the core of our campus. There was a codicil in that document, which Cooper made a point to write to me about, and it's in our library, that one of the things that Wood insisted upon was the preservation of the remarkable natural hammock that we call the Botanical Garden. More about that later. There we are. That's what it looked like in February of 1961. You can see the one building, some of you will recognize it, that's the core of our human relations area on campus. Uh, you see that where the quad is, is being constructed, and the layout there, it's in black over on the left side, that's where the president's office is going to be. Uh, that little bit of strip of land out there behind it that's kind of uh, whitish is a dirt road that we call Babcock Street. Change was underway. Uh, there was going to be growth. And what you see in the center of that dark area, that's what's now the Botanical Garden. The first building, and it was Homer Denius that provided the money for it, was the beginning of the quad. You see the president's office, now the John Miller presidential office building, and to the right of it, what would become our first classrooms. Uh, the little building there on the right is the registrar's office right here for the University of Melbourne. This will become the university's first library. Here would be Gleason Auditorium, the Link Building, now the Evans Building, and over in here, the Denius Student Union. One thing you can say about Jerry Cooper is when the 60s began, he didn't need any kind of psychedelic drugs to have visions of the future. When he told people that there's going to be a university here that's going to change the character of post-secondary education, people looked at him and wondered, what precisely uh, uh, medical regimen is this man on? By April, this is what it looked like. Brevard Engineering College, you see the first buildings uh, are standing, the first classrooms are there. And Cooper, Cooper was a man that was parsimonious. The only bathroom that was available was in the president's office. And so that meant that when he was there, of course, he worked his day job out at the Missile Test Project, uh, people would be coming in and going out, and Jerry Cooper could make sure that he got the vibe, I don't think he would have used that word, for what the missile men thought of this rising star in American education. I should add it personally, that remained the principal bathroom uh, for a, a number of years in the quad. And I can tell you as a faculty member, I studiously avoided going there because you would walk in there and President Cooper would come up with some ideas and say, Patterson, uh, you need to do this. And so uh, uh, I would be very careful about uh, the use of that building and make sure that there was not a green 1952 MG parked there uh, if I wanted to avoid an assignment. One legacy of the 1956 University of Melbourne is this bas relief that still exists on our human resources area. In fact, there are two bas reliefs. Um, one of them had disappeared, and I crawled around the building and found it behind. I think it was a bougainvillea, and and we cut it back so you can see it now. This is an aspirational, aspirational. Elizabeth Wood and Margaret Hutchinson. Uh, who were the founders of the University of Melbourne, had this vision that there would be a college in which the different races of the world and the different continents would come together. So you see there uh, uh, a representative of Africa, one of Asia, and one of the Americas, uh, rising above on the left of the world, uh, a dove of peace flying, a book in the hand of one, a pair of of scales for justice and an academic degree in the other. And the idea was in 1956 that there would be a college in which a global student body would be formed. In 1956, in a racially segregated Melbourne, Florida, that was a vision which people did not think would ever be realized. 
But as I rode my bike home this afternoon, I saw that campus. I saw that sometimes dreams do become realities if people have the energy, the determination, and remarkable students who are looking to make a difference in their lives. That's that building that I've talked about. The bas relief is there. You can see it vaguely over here on the far left. This was our first library. It also served as our first cafeteria and place in which there was a ping pong emporium uh, at Florida Tech. We make small things go a long way. Cooper, Cooper was a guy who had a vision of what Florida should look like. And he thought there should be palm trees. And so he planted a bunch of royal palms on Country Club Boulevard, and immediately a cold snap came about and killed most of them. So Cooper said, I've got to learn something about palm trees. And the man you see on his right is Dent Smith, who was a Wall Street stockbroker who made a fortune in the Great Depression. You know, you, you always find some that are able to figure out a way to prevail when everyone else is not doing as well. And then Smith had moved to Daytona Beach and had started the International Palm Society. So one day, Jerry Cooper told me, he drove up to Daytona Beach and said, I've got this college and I want to have uh, palm trees on it. And then Cooper did something that faculties, members and professors don't often do. He admitted, I don't know anything about palm trees, but I'd like to learn. And so Dent Smith became a great friend of Jerry Cooper's and taught him a lot about palm trees. And that was the beginning of the uh, botanical palm collection, which went, as you know, to have uh, many, many different species of palm trees. Unfortunately, many of them were cold sensitive. Some of you will remember a Washingtonia palm tree that every year we would build a structure around in fact, Cooper had me once out there with an extension cord putting an electric blanket around the bottom of that washer. That Washingtonian palm tree is no longer with us. It's gone on to palm tree heaven. Uh, you've got to be careful about those exotics. Many funny stories uh, can be told about the botanical garden and uh, Cooper's interest in it. By the second year, uh, look at the degrees that we are moving towards, a BS in electrical engineering. Some of you I recognize as electrical engineers in mathematics, in electrical engineering. And this is what caught the attention of some German missile scientists. We were the first university in the world to offer a master's degree in space technology. What is space technology? An article in Newsweek magazine asked, uh, Werner von Braun said, called us at Countdown College, they teach space technology. In 1962, our first honorary degree was given by Jerry Cooper to two individuals. Uh, Tom Adams was the Secretary of State, and this, this fellow who was a Mercury astronaut, Virgil Gus Grissom. Uh, Gus Grissom had a fondness for the university, and after the tragedy of the Apollo 1 fire in 1967, uh, one of the first, I think it was within a week, Grissom Hall, where some of you studied, I know all you did in Grissom Hall was study, some of you studied and did your homework, was named after Virgil Gus Grissom. In 1964, and there he is again, the man on the right, that's General Medeiros who's now in his civvies, who is a faculty member at the university, and Werner von Braun, uh, Werner von Braun delivered the commencement address in 1964. And as you see, that first cartoon about, let's stop Whitland, let's have Space University, you see a rocket saying, that's my boy, that's my girl. The two of them uh, are shown uh, out in front of what was to become our alumni house that is now a lovely alumni center. At the time it was just a house and they get they they got together there before a, a dinner that was held. In 1966, in August 1966, the Board of Trustees 
changed uh, the name of the university. Clipper said, Brevard Engineering College, that's provincial. We're more than that. And Tom Adams, who was the Secretary of State, had kept a watchful eye and in 1966 informed Clipper that the name Florida Institute of Technology was available to the amendment of the charter for Brevard Engineering College. When the announcement was made that the school's name was changing, the somewhat troubled manager of the Brevard Engineering bookstore called up Cooper and said, what am I to do? I just bought another order of Brevard Engineering College t-shirts. Cooper said, raise the price. They're collector items now. That's, I think, a way to make a university great. I'll pull it together with these group of slides. Some of you know that Jerry Cooper was a, a MG aficionado. And you see a picture of Jerry Cooper wearing his MG cap there uh, in an MG show. Uh, Jerry Cooper was a, he used to call me up at late at night. And those of you who heard new Cooper, he had a kind of interesting Gordon, you're Jerry Cooper. <laughs> Always kind of barking. On my 25th wedding anniversary, he lent me the 1952 MG that he had driven around with a board describing his idea to start a college so I could take my wife Joy out. Um, she was taking a class at the time, and I parked it underneath in front of the president's office, and she came out, and I honked the horn and I said, lady, let's go for a ride. Uh, the water pump went out, <laughs> the darn thing. Jerry Cooper said, Gordon, I'll be there to fix it. This was a hell of a nice guy. There you see Jerry Cooper in the center, proudly sporting the first FIT, Florida Institute of Technology t-shirt. Below you see Cooper standing in front of, of course, the Crawford building. And there in the center, you see, Jerry Cooper and Jim Stoms. Jim Stoms is the guy that got Cooper to come here. Jim Stoms was ultimately the man who founded our business program, what is now the BIS College. Jim Stoms is the guy that hired me and convinced Jerry Cooper and John Miller to take a chance on this guy. And I remember Miller saying to me, you know, Stoms vouched for you. And he said something a little stronger, but I think the message was, don't mess it up. And of course, on the left, you see the statue that faculty and students and alums have placed in the center of the quad, the statue of Jerry Cooper with his uh, bow tie. And if you notice, some of you took 1101 and 1102 or SciTech Com taught by someone like uh, 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 Rolanda, who I see is present. You're taking that, you see that the uh, apostrophes changed. In the opening slide, it was Founders Day. Now it's plural because you are the founders. You're the founders, an alumni association. That's the energy that drives the university. Men and women who've passed through here, spent a little bit of the precious time of your youth here, gone out and made a difference. I was privileged today to stand in front of about 100 of those young men and women who will become the Panthers of tomorrow. It's a great tradition, a great place. And for that, I have only gratitude and thankfulness that these 40 years have gone by so very quickly. So I'll end at this point and say, are there any questions? And I know Al Hagumpian and uh, Jordan will have this question. And the answer is, it's the final that counts. And the final chapter in our university's history it's going to be written by folks like you. So thanks a lot. I'll stop sharing my screen if any of you have any questions. I think I went about 30 minutes because, uh, you know, the way it works, I'm used to doing a 50-minute schedule, but I know that you may have some things to say. And remember, liar, liar, pants on fire. If I said something wrong or is egregiously in error, you be sure to correct me because that's what uh, you're supposed to do. So thanks a lot. All right, if anyone has any questions, feel free to type them in the chat or unmute yourself and ask.
Uh, Larry Pollock asked, did the president ever wear anything other than a bow tie? To which Doug replied, yes, a shirt and trousers. But I don't think that's what he meant when he asked. <laughs> You know, uh, I never saw him in the gym, so I don't know if he had uh, uh, any clues. The bow tie became his signature. Cooper, Cooper uh, went to the University of Virginia for his PhD, and that's where he met John Miller. They were both in the physics doctoral program there. And Miller told the story that both of them got into the habit of wearing these blue seersucker suits. You know, uh, the University of Virginia kind of a way in which you look like a gentleman who is just a, a pursuing an education for a leisurely pastime. And I think it was there that he started wearing the bow tie to be a kind of standout figure. But I never asked him about the bow tie. I have found in my uh, uh, experience that asking men about the clothes they're wearing is uh, something that often will produce a kind of curious look of what's wrong with you. Uh, uh, can't you dress yourself? Uh, so uh, I don't know fully the answer exactly where it came from, but my surmise is it was from their Virginia days. Uh, Doug McCullough asked, um, you mentioned that Cooper had a connection to Connecticut. Did Ray Work also have a connection to Connecticut? I don't know. Uh, uh, Ray and Martha Work, for those of you who knew them, were just marvels. They were really part of the energy behind our athletic program. Ray Work was a, a, an Ohio Buckeye, graduate of Ohio State, had a passion for that. I believe uh, that Ray Work met uh, Jerry Cooper. In fact, I know he did, uh, in that Ray was working as a member of the systems analyst team, which Cooper came down to head, and Charles Cummings, who was a division head, introduced, I believe, Cooper to Ray Work there. So I don't think they knew one another in Connecticut. Uh, uh, I think they met uh, at, at the Cape. Any more questions before we do trivia? Oh, Tony asked, who was student number one? Uh, the student number one, that's a, that, that I don't have an answer to. Uh, Reagan DuBose was the first graduate uh, with an associate degree. And Gary Grant, who is our you know, hardworking development officer, uh, uh, contacted Reagan. I, I, I'm not sure he's still extant. He was living in the San Francisco area and wasn't able to come back to campus a few years ago. So that's that's degree number one. I've got a picture of him receiving that uh, diploma and it, it, it's a it's it's smaller. Uh, but as Cooper would say, it's a collector's item uh, and uh, you need to share it. And I'm going to show you something if I can find right here. Many of you may remember this. Uh, it was a tradition to hand out, they may come out of focus. This is a beanie, a Florida Tech beanie. Uh, and when you were a freshman, you received one of these and you were called, I bet some of you did this, a frog. And one of the traditions of being a frog was you'd get out on country club in the middle of the night in front of where Jillian is seated and do the frog hop down the street and the upperclassmen would razz you about doing that. So I've got my Florida Tech beanie on right now and uh, I, I suspect some of you um, may have had that experience. Once again, this is a collector's item uh, and we in the Alumni and Development Office will be auctioning it off uh, as an opportunity. Now, right now, I'll hang on to the beanie for a little bit longer. I, I wear it around the house on occasions. It, it, my wife uses these things as part of the brief for the attorney on the inst institutionalization procedure. When I go to the old professor's rest home, yes, he wears this funny little cap with FIT on it and keeps saying, I'm fit. Uh, and other people uh, don't know how, how fit he really is. I wish I had one of those beanies to give away, but alas, I do not. Um, Mike Usak said that he had to frog jump down the country club. So if you ever want to uh, reenact that, Gordon, let me know so I can come out and watch. And I just learned. Everyone. Oh, I was just going to say, I just, I'm the university archivist, brand new. And I just learned about the frog jump this morning because I was looking through the 1969 yearbook and was very confused 
by some of the photos I found, what on earth is going on? And, and, and that was my first introduction to the, the frog jump. <laughs> well, That's amazing, I, Anna. <laughs> and you're in for a treat because our streak, uh, which I have written about, and some of you may have been involved in our 1974 streak in which more than 500 people took off from Crawford, did a run down to the uh, dorm quad and then came back. Uh, a, a local minister uh, called for a moral rearmament. Uh, you know, the, the orphans and crippled children and widows in Melbourne were being shocked by all of these naked uh, FIT students running around. So uh, uh, I, I should tell you, uh, uh, Carrie Clark, who some of you know, uh, it was a great, great teacher, passed away years ago. Um, he and um, Gary, uh, uh, um, oh gosh, what was Gary's last name? See, I forget. Another faculty member um, uh, learned that the Crimson photographer, uh, that his camera had been confiscated by the police. And they went down and said, you can't take that. And they got it back. And one day after a run, I, I've been a run, I was a runner for 50 years, uh, I came in my running gear, I was clothed, and found on my st step a FedEx packet that contained the film from that run of these naked people. And I gave it to the development office and I said, listen, I think that some of these alums, and so if you were there, be careful. I said, I bet you could use this as a means by which to encourage our alums to make donations to the university, uh, that perhaps this picture could be lost or it could be published. So be careful out there. There are some pictures that I think are in the development office's uh, hands right now, uh, which uh, well, you were younger then, and uh, I'm sure you look just as good today, too. Oh, now the development officers are rushing to find that. <laughs> All right, one more question, and then we're going to go to trivia and giveaways. Al Gary Wells, yes. Gary Wells, thank you. Gary Wells. Al Hagopian asks, are there any pictures of the rope swing from the old jungle? Oh, Jill says it's documented. No, unfortunately, they're not. And I remember that rope swing. It was, it was, uh, you know, there was a little bridge across Crane Creek that was taken away that would, that connected to what now there was in the Columbia Village. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I I know that rope swing. I, I used to play out there, but uh, they they took the rope swing away. You know, there's a there's a primate in all of us. And if you show a rope to a guy and a tree that it's hanging from, and you think, well, hell, I'll I'll take a I'll take a run on that. One more question that I overlooked from Vicki. She asked when the first female graduate um, student graduated. Hard question. Uh, and I don't have an immediate answer, but the archivist is there and we would need to go look through the alumni records. I would imagine, well, Joan Sherman, is a real interesting story. Joan Sherman, Sherman was a chemist. She rose to be the first division head at Harris that was a woman. She worked for uh, uh, Cooper at the Space Project. She was a chemist, graduated from Northwestern. And one day she was sitting around in 1958 and, 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 and Ms. Sherman told me the story. She was sitting and the men at the table were talking about her as a chemist and they were smoking a cigar. And she said, give me a cigar, I can smoke that. And she took a drag on it and this lanky guy showed up and said, could you teach chemistry at my college? And it was Jerry Cooper. And so our one of our first chemistry professors was a cigar smoking woman from Evanston, Illinois named Joan Sherman. She went on uh, to play him as a, a, a chief engineer at, at Harris. But along the way she earned, I think she may have been the first woman to earn a master's degree in ocean engineering uh, at the time. Uh, I'll have to look into that. That's a good question. At one point in 1966, 67, I believe there were seven women students. That's when we were now. And 
I've talked to several of them uh, about what it was like, you know, uh, to be one of the seven, uh, just like the Mercury Seven. Um, you know, they were they were going, and that's what isn't that one of the great things? If you look at today, the number of women in colleges and universities are larger than the number of men. And I look out at the horizon that my women students face, they, they, they have so many more opportunities, largely because the generation that came before them pioneered uh, those ways. And one of those women students, and this will be the last thing I say for a while, maybe not the last thing, but is one of my women students said to me, Oh, Professor Patterson, you're so mid 20th century. And I said, you're absolutely right. You're looking at it, dip me in amber, uh, because that's what I am and that's what this place is about. So, you know, when you see me in the museum of professors in amber, that student gave me the idea for it. All right. Well, I hope everyone was paying very close attention to uh, Dr. Patterson's story of our founding because I've been writing questions as he's speaking. So um, I have five um, gifts to give away. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what the, the prizes are. Then I'm going to ask a question. The first person to get it right in the chat will win the prize and you can pick what you'd like. Okay. So pay attention when I announce them at the beginning because I'm not gonna uh, refresh your memory. Okay, prize number one, a Florida Tech Turvis for hot and cold beverages. Ooh. We have a very nice Florida Tech 1958 sweatshirt. That's very, very soft from League. It's a size large, but if you want this and you're not a size large, I will return it for you and get you the right size. I have a men's Florida Tech 1958 Panthers t-shirt for those of you who live in warmer climates. And then I have a women's Panthers 1958 t-shirt in red. And then I have this lovely Florida Tech sweatshirt blanket. All right, so think about what you want. And uh, if you get a question right, you get to pick and I will send that to you as soon as possible. Okay, here we go. Stretch your fingers, get ready to type. All right, question number one. Florida Tech was the first university in the world to offer a master's degree in what field? Uh, space technology is correct. Jose Suarez, what would you like for your prize? Jose, if you want to unmute. Oh, the shirt, the t-shirt? T-shirt. Okay, very good. Question number two. What color was Jerry Cooper's 1952 MG that Dr. Patterson looked out for to decide if he wanted to use the president's bathroom? Uh, we have Cindy, who was the first to answer. I don't know if I can let you win, Cindy. She's my, she's my colleague. Um, <laughs> who's the second? Larry, Larry Pollock. You're number one for green. Larry, which prize would you like? You want to unmute yourself to let me know. Gray sweatshirt. Okay, awesome. Question number three. Okay, and, and if I recorded this incorrectly, Gordon has the authority to overrule whatever I say for the answer. <laughs> And what bar was the historical 37 cents laid down on the table as the first investment in Brevard Engineering College? Pelican, but Cindy again. Pelican bar, Wilbur, you are the winner. Wilbur, would you like the Turvis, the sweatshirt blanket, uh, or a female t-shirt for a female friend? 
Turvis. Nice choice, sir. All right, we still have the women's t-shirt and the sweatshirt blanket. Okay, question number four. What is the name of Jerry Cooper's wife? Not Elizabeth Wood. Natalie, that's right, Marion. Woo! Marion, would you like the sweatshirt blanket or the women's t-shirt? I'm laughing at Mrs. Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> I think I like that's that. a great runner-up answer, without a doubt. It's accurate. <laughs> yes, I should have said the first name. Technically, it's her name, too. All right, the fifth and final question for the sweatshirt blanket. Let's see here. How many people enrolled in the first term of Brevard Engineering College in fall of 1958? Vicki Nurley, right out of the gate, 144. There you go. And Vicki, uh, where you are in Huntsville, you should be able to use the sweatshirt blanket. Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today and playing along. Any uh, last minute questions for Dr. Patterson before we get off our call here? Great presentation. Thank you, Mike. Thank you all so much for letting me just muse about the university. I, uh, I, I am fond. I'm fond of our university, as are you. Go Panthers. Go Panthers. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, all right, everyone. Have a wonderful evening, and we'll see you soon.